I'm Dennis Anderson along with Julie Zenner and here's what's coming up on Almanac North. Families struggling with aging issues have a local resource in AgeWell Arrowhead. We'll talk about the services it provides and opportunities to volunteer. Duluth's Community Relations Officer will join us to talk about her job and the many ways Duluthians can get involved in making the city a better place for all. And early reports are out on attendance at the Festival of Sale. That story and more in the business news. It's all coming up right now on Almanac North. Hello and welcome once again to Almanac North. Thank you very much for watching. Our show is recorded on Wednesday this week so the studio can be prepared for the August membership drive. We'll have more on that a bit later. Now here's Julie with our first guest. All right, thanks Denny and welcome everyone. Many of us have experienced the frustration and heartache of watching our parents or grandparents struggling with aging issues. For others, dealing with the impact of dementia can take a heavy toll. If you find yourself in this situation, you may need help finding the resources you need. That's when AgeWell Arrowhead can step in and help. Here to tell us more about the services it provides is Kim Heilman, Program Director for AgeWell Arrowhead, and Peter Hafton is the Training Coordinator for AgeWell Arrowhead, and thanks to both of you for being here. Thank you for we having really us. Appreciate it. Kim, um, AgeWell Arrowhead is a relatively new organization, so for people who may not be familiar with it and what it does, can you just kind of give us the short course? Sure, absolutely. We've been around since about 200, 200, excuse me, 2015. Uh, it, our goal as an organization is to provide services and supports so that our aging uh, friends and family can stay in their homes longer, mm -hmm. uh, thereby extending their resources. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Peter, you're looking for volunteers to help people stay in their homes longer, is that correct? Yeah, we're And you do some of the training work for that. Yes, I do. So we're always looking for volunteers to help out with all of our services, whether it's grocery shopping or ride services. Um, a lot of the volunteers that I utilize have to do with evidence-based workshops that happen in our community to support seniors' mm -hmm. health. If somebody wants to volunteer, how do they get a hold of you? Is there a website or something? Yep, they can look at agewellarrowhead.org. They can also call Kim. That's the easiest way to, to connect to volunteers, mm -hmm. uh, the services. Mm -hmm. okay. So people are, are able to stay in their own personal space. That is correct. Uh, we're living longer uh -huh. uh, and healthier, I would like to think. And if we can stay in our own homes, we're happier. And quite honestly, there's not enough resources locally in, say, the assisted living communities um, as the silver tsunami, as I call it, uh, we're aging at such a rapid rate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, you mentioned the, the grocery shopping, and I have to say that I, I have volunteered with the Groceries to Go program, and it is fabulous. <laughs> but talk about how important just that simple service of getting people's groceries can be and how that program works. Sure, uh, we enroll our clients, we call them once a week to mm -hmm. see if they have an order, there's no obligation. Uh, that serves as a social interaction and a touch point. Then we grocery shop and deliver based on where you live in proximity to the stores we use. Mm -hmm. Uh, we also deliver, we can help put those groceries away. And again, that's another social interaction and a touch point with that client. Many of our clients have no one living near to them doing the wellness checks. Uh, we notice a decline or changes over time. And then there's a process for the volunteers to let us in the office know. And then we have a course of action. Uh -huh. You bring up a good point. So. You you actually provide wellness checks for, for individuals? Yes, we do, mm -hmm. yeah. And I would assume too then that if a person has a volunteer coming to their home with some regularity, maybe the same person, they must form a relationship. How important is that? Incredibly important. Some of our 
Aging friends and neighbors are very isolated in their own homes. They can't drive anymore. They can't walk to take a bus. So by having that volunteer interaction in the home, whether it's our companion program or grocery shopping or transportation to and from medical appointments, they form that bond. And we have one volunteer who has said that this particular client has become her second grandma. Really? And that she's learned more from her than anyone yeah. else. Mm -hmm. Peter, you mentioned evidence-based mm -hmm. training. Um, explain that term and, and what kinds of training might fall into that category. Yeah, one of my roles at Agewell Arrowhead as the training coordinator mm -hmm. is to set up the evidence-based workshops. Um, that can be workshops like Matter of Balance, Living Well with Chronic Pain, Living Well with Diabetes. And the reason they're called evidence-based is because um, there's a number of different pieces of information that are collected and so in the beginning of the workshop, the participants will take a pre-survey, which evaluates their health. So they'll rate their health and, um, you know, whether they feel like they're fearful of falling or their health is poor, then they'll complete the workshop and we also ask them to do a post-survey. And mm -hmm. so we hope that they'll have gathered all kinds of information um, throughout the workshop mm -hmm. and then they're feeling more confident with their health. And sure. so all of that information is gathered and then put into a database collected through the state of Minnesota through the Juniper Health Network, mm -hmm. and you can log on and, and really kind of evaluate that as a trainer as well as yeah. um, managing the program. And then do you use the information that's gathered also in terms of trying to identify programs and services that Agewell Arrowhead offers that might be a good fit for them too? It, it could be used that way. We could, uh -huh. we could identify somebody who, you know, maybe needs some more help with their chores at home yeah. or, or things like that. But also I use those to identify other classes that they might be appropriate for um, if they're struggling with diabetes or if they've had a fall to invite them to a class. To Peter, what are you out. looking for in volunteers? I, I would think compassion would be at the top of the, top of the header. Yeah, absolutely. I just had a volunteer meeting this morning and that was one of the things that they talked about of how rewarding it is to work with older adults and to, to either help them improve their health or just make that connection on a community level. Um, so for a lot of the workshops that I put on, I definitely look for that. Mm -hmm. um, for people even to be just energetic and excited about the material. Mm -hmm. Now in addition to the volunteers, um, partners in the community, I imagine are very important and Absolutely. you're starting out a memory cafe. Yes, yes, we have had our Agewell Memory Cafe for a year now. Uh, is that a common term, uh, a memory cafe? Yes, it is. Okay. Memory cafes were actually started in Denmark long ago and traveled across to the states. There are a huge, huge network of memory cafes in the states, um, inter uh, national percolator groups as we call them because we always serve coffee at our <laughs> memory cafes. Uh, and it's, it's an opportunity for people suffering from some form of dementia and their care partner to come together and leave the caregiver, care receiver hat at the door and have an opportunity to socialize with others who are in a similar journey. Uh, there's no stigma. There's, uh, it's just fun. This morning we were out on the uh, St. Louis, St. Louis River excursion with our group. Nice. Had a great time. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. And you're going to be having some upcoming memory cafes at the aquarium. Yes, we are. We were very, very fortunate to have a uh, private supporter funder uh, gift us and we will be holding September through December memory cafes at the Great Lakes Aquarium with customized programming. Um, the first week is uh, snakes, turtles, and gators, oh my. Oh my. <laughs> uh, and so we've got a lot of fun activities. It's, it's a bit of classroom, it's some arts, it's tactile. Um, you know, we get to pet a sturgeon and uh, watch the otters. It's it's yeah. really a lot of fun. Is there some kind of support for caregivers as well? Yes. What can you address yes. that a little bit? Absolutely. Uh, caregivers do a wonderful, wonderful job, but they're often unsupported, mm -hmm. and so we have an actual caregiver counselor on our staff and she's able to provide counseling on a one-on-one -on -one basis to support that caregiver in the journey. Whether it's in your home, at a coffee shop, we can go into places of employment and provide employee supports. 
Um, oftentimes caregivers are part of that sandwich generation, you know, taking care of aging parents and children, but there's no one supporting them. Mm. And the number of uh, caregivers that pass before a care receiver is astonishing because they don't focus on themselves mm. and their well-being. Yeah, interesting. Peter, is there a specific um, training that you offer for those caregivers through your program as well? Through the dementia training oh. that I provide for businesses, yeah. we have a whole section where we talk about supporting working caregivers um, and provide the employees and the managers some different resources to support somebody who's taking care of a loved one as well as managing a full-time working career, um, which can be extremely exhausting. So. Not only do we provide some different resources as well as suggestions to the employer, but we also could connect them to our, our care consultant at Agewell Arrowhead. Mm -hmm. When you talk about doing dementia training with businesses, is it primarily to train them how to respond to um, dementia problems within their own employees and families, or is it how to respond to customers who come in who might be having those issues? Primarily, it's the customers. Um, just preparing for an aging population with places like dental clinics, banks, credit unions, um, even the city of Duluth, all preparing for an aging population and how to adjust with um, you know, a customer who comes in who is maybe acting confused or frustrated, um, disoriented, um, and being able to recognize that and then support that customer. Mm -hmm. But there are also employees who are aging as well um, and who are also taking care of aging parents. So the training is really relevant in a lot of different ways. For is there a screening process then for those who will become volunteers? Um, that would be a, a question for Kim. Yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, there is. There's an application on our website, Denny, or anyone can call 218-623-7800 uh, and connect with me. Uh, there is an application. We do background checks because of the audience sure. that we work with. And then it's really finding out what you as a volunteer want to get out of the experience and then matching that with what we have as an opportunity. It can be one hour a month mm -hmm. um, or three hours a week. It's, it's what you want because mm -hmm. we want it to be fulfilling for you and the client. Mm -hmm. And when you say clients, um, do they get referred to you or do they sign up on their own? How, how do you get those people tapped into your services? Through a multitude of different ways. We have a lot of uh, physician referrals, um, especially for people who have been recently diagnosed with a memory loss. Uh, churches, uh, United Way is a good referral partner for us. Uh, there's really no end mm -hmm. to that resource. Can mm -hmm. you run down some of the services the volunteers do provide? Absolutely. Uh, as Julie mentioned, we grocery shop right. and deliver. Mm -hmm. We provide transportation to and from medical appointments or to run errands or to go to Dairy Queen if that's sure. what you want. Yep. Uh, we have uh, snow shoveling and lawn mowing. Uh, we also have a program called Transitions where when you have lived independently as long as safely possible and you need to make that next move, I can help find a location, tour facilities, help with realtors, um, the, all of the moving parts that go into that. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to interrupt, but we have about 30 seconds and I know you want to talk about your fundraiser Absolutely. coming up. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. We are hosting our first ever fundraiser called The Art of Aging. September 26th at Northland Country Club from 5 p.m. until question mark, as I'm sure it's going to be great fun. Lots of local artists and beautiful craftsmanship. Uh, all of the proceeds will support our transportation program. Um, tickets are available. You can just give us a call. All right, Kim, Peter, thank you so much for coming in and thank you for the work that you're doing uh, to help folks that we all know and we all love. Thank so. you. Thank you both. Thank you.
Well, this week marked the primary election here in Duluth where civic-minded residents threw their hats in the ring and ran for city council or even for mayor. Congratulations to those who moved on and also to those who cared enough about their city to run for office. Others may not want to make the commitment it takes to run for an office, but still some want to be involved in city government in some fashion. Now, if that sounds like you, you may want to consider applying for a city board or commission. And here to tell us more about those opportunities is Alicia Kozlowski, Community Relations Director for the City of Duluth. Thanks for being here, Alicia. So, your title, what does your job entail? That's a great question. <laughs> so as Community Relations Officer, this position really exists um, to be everything about constituent services. So connecting Duluthians with crucial services and programs. And the other component is also to be a liaison between the mayor's office and other city departments, as well as intergovernmental agencies and other community groups. It's really at the forefront with community. Mm -hmm. Talk about some of your personal connections to the community. Um, did you grow up here in Duluth? Mm -hmm. and yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. Well, I grew up in Duluth. Now, my family is from the Grand Portage and Fond du Lac reservations, and um, Duluth, their Masabi Kong, as we call it, uh, is definitely our homeland. And um, I grew up in the West End neighborhood. My, uh, my family grew up like right above Johnson's Bakery and kind of out in West Duluth as well. So definitely a homegrown. I love this community. I love everything about Duluth. And I went to college at UMD and for my undergraduate. And then I went on to get my master's of business administration at St. Scholastica. Mm -hmm. and You've been a in, busy lady. Yes, definitely. <laughs> I think that's why this position works so well is yeah. because I want to do all the things in life. And so I do a lot of running. I run with the Quaypac, which is an indigenous women's running group. I play broom ball and hockey yeah. and soccer with all the community groups. It's, it's all about connection for me. Now you've been on the job for about <laughs> six months. Uh, tell us about commissions and, and uh, the different boards in the city that mm -hmm. uh, perhaps still need to be filled. There may be some vacancies that people can actually apply for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question too. Is, um, our boards and commissions is definitely a big component of the work that I do is helping the staff and make sure that um, our boards and commissions and authorities as well are representative and reflective of, of our Duluth population. And that's one of the, the points of joy in my position is working on boards and commission. We have over 30 of them and our newest board is the Energy Commission, which was just newly created um, by the city council. And it's one of the best ways to get engaged, to have your voice heard. Um, it's really open to anybody who is, who is looking to use their time and talents to improve the quality of life. And so we have just tons of them. And to be able to access and see all of the openings, would love for folks to be able to go to uh, DuluthMN.gov backslash boards dash commissions. Sure. And there you'll see all the different vacancies. It's a great opportunity to be able to see um, what the boards and commissions are all about. We have everything from parks and recreation to planning to community development and beyond. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things I hear a lot is what if I screwed up and what if I, what if I don't have time? And so some of those things are I, we're working as an internal staff and in collaboration with different folks who are currently serving on boards to really help uh, make boards and commissions open and welcoming to everybody and because it does take a little bit of time but it's maybe once a month mm -hmm. depending on the board and then not every board always meets through the summer so it's not necessarily a huge time commitment yeah. um, and then also the the what if I'm not qualified piece we have tons of staff and your fellow residents who serve on the boards and commissions who are more than willing to help um, ease you into it and so Really, it, it just comes down to finding the right composition of sure. folks from across the city. Um, what's your your diverse background and experience? Um, we, we welcome all of it and, mm -hmm. and encourage Wonderful. anybody to apply. When you look uh, kind of across the city at the boards and commissions mm -hmm. with an eye toward engaging diverse voices and, and diverse perspectives, how do you think Duluth's doing on that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's one of the huge focus areas mm -hmm. and one of the things that I'm so proud about working at the city is that we stop and say it's, it's about fundamentally asking different questions. And so 
whose voices are there and whose voices are not. And sometimes it's not even about whose voices are at the table so much as resetting the table. Mm -hmm. And so looking at access um, and how it is that we recruit, how we do engagement and outreach, and going out to folks to be able to um, tailor it to a different audience who mm -hmm. maybe otherwise wouldn't know about a border commission or you don't know somebody who served before and so then you don't necessarily see yourself reflected or see a path for you to be on a board and commission. Actually, that's how I came to the city, mm -hmm. is through the Community Development Committee. Uh. And before that, was serving on Imagine Duluth 2035, which was the comprehensive plan. And so I always go back to, to that document because that came out of co-creation, co-investment with community, and all embedded with fairness of Here's the ways that we want to yeah. engage and to move us forward. So does the board that you've applied to sit on, uh, is, is, is it that board then that determines if an if a applicant is qualified? Yeah, so the process for being able to be appointed is, is what you're talking about. Right. So yeah, the mayor makes the appointments. And so if you go on and apply to a board, then our staff who staff the board will review the application mm -hmm. and then we'll also then send it on up to Mayor Larson for review and then it does have to go through council resolution sure. for the appointment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the, the Quipec that yes. you've been involved in. And interesting story, group of uh, indigenous women who mm -hmm. run. Talk about that and what it brings to your life and to the other members of the group. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness, I could talk for days about Quaypac. <laughs> so Quaypac is a collective of indigenous women and we've been running for eight years together. In we started out, there was five of us in the early stages, and now we've grown to over 150 active runners uh, in Minnesota and Wisconsin and actually beyond. And I would say Quaypac is a humongous driver and just an extension of who we are and how we live, and it absolutely comes into my, into my work as a community relations officer. As a Quaypac, we've all started running for various reasons, and a lot of time it's as a result of grief or sickness, whether that's mental health or addictions in families, different substance abuse, um, grief and losing a child or a loved sure. one. And we've been able to find this space and cultivate a space that didn't exist yeah, yeah. Um, just for indigenous women. And it's so much more than just the running. I mean, we run 5Ks on up to 50 milers together. Yeah, wonderful. And uh, it, it is so much joy and yeah. positivity. And Alicia, and, on that positive mm -hmm. note, we have to say goodbye. Thank you for being here. Really Absolutely. appreciate you coming in. Thank you for having me. Thank you. now to the business news from the editors at Business North. Participants in the art trade are opening up their studios to the public this weekend in northwestern Wisconsin. Three working artists in the tiny village of Herbster, population 104, are sponsoring a studio art tour on Saturday and Sunday to showcase their work. It's the 11th year for the tour. The artists will include painters, weavers, quilters, wood turners, jewelers, ceramic artists, printmakers, and fiber artists. Herbster is located on Highway 13, about 25 miles west of Bayfield. Early indications suggest the Festival of Sail held in Duluth this past week attracted fewer visitors than a predecessor event in 2016. Visitors said the latest show didn't offer as many vessels to see and tour. Some also noted the prior event was plagued by long lines and long waits, prompting some potential visitors to stay home this year. This week's event partially overlapped with the annual Blues Festival, alerting potential attendees that the city might be overly congested with people and traffic. 
A staunch supporter of Eveleth and the Iron Range has passed away. Former mayor and state legislator Joe Begich died August 10th at age 89. U.S. Senator Amy Klobuchar called him a longtime advocate and defender of the Iron Range, labor, seniors, and Minnesota's working class families. Among the causes he championed is the Polymet Copper Nickel Mine near Hoyt Lakes. Two years ago, he was honored by the St. Louis County, which designated Highway 101 as Representative Joe Begich Highway, where it passes by his home. For more regional economic news, visit businessnorth.com. You can watch our past shows and keep up to date on current topics by following Almanac North on our social media channels. Look for our pages on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. And if you're looking for updates about your favorite PBS programs, visit the WDSC website where you will also find news about the station and learn about our many upcoming events. And Julie, there will be no Almanac North program next week during the WDSC August membership drive. That's right, but make sure you watch and make sure you call in and give that pledge of support. That's for sure. <laughs> A lot of great programming coming up over the next week. For Julie and the crew at Almanac North, I'm Dennis Anderson. Good night, everybody, and be kind.